Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Skadaka's Library and Chats with Champions. Chats has a 15-year history presenting programs that span the interests of all segments of our community. <coughs> our next chat is Tuesday, June 27th at 10 a.m., when nationally noted artist and sculptor Jack Bessery will talk about his involvement in World Wood Day. His talk is entitled World Wood Collaboration, Making Art with Others. Chats is sponsored by Ch Sherman's Main Coast Bookshop. Today we have as our speaker, Elizabeth Hellitzer, the Executive Director of the Maine Holocaust and Human Rights Center of Maine. Ms. Hellitzer will describe the free educational outreach programs, exhibitions, compelling program, and special events that the Holocaust and Human Rights Center has to offer. The center is located on the campus of the University of Maine at Augusta in the Michael Clark Center. <clears throat> It is a statewide nonprofit that uses the lessons of the Nazi Holocaust and other genocides to combat prejudice and discrimination in Maine and beyond, while also encouraging individuals and communities to reflect and act upon their ethical and moral responsibilities in our modern world. Programs such as decision making in times of injustice, yearning to breathe free, the Immigrant Experience in Maine, and Civil Rights in America are three of the many programs offered at the center. In addition, this talk will include a 12-minute film about Michael Clark, a child survivor hidden during the Holocaust, who after the war met and married a woman from Fort Kent, Maine. Today's chat is presented in collaboration with the Emo Landau Human Rights Forum. The forum was established in 2008 to honor the memory of Ima Landau by providing a continuing structure to help pe all people in our community commit to the understanding that we treat each other with respect and tolerance. A survivor of the Holocaust, the late Ima Landau of Damascata was an inspiration to young and old throughout Maine during the 15 years he lived here. The Landau Forum will continue to be held annually as part of the Chats with Champions series. We have a copy, if it's free, uh, on the table after you leave of Ingo Landau's book. It's also my pleasure to have Carolyn Landau in the front row. He was with her. Thank you for coming. Right now, it's my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth. I started it and I was hiding back there, so <laughs> just sort of creepily stayed. <laughs> Thank you for having me here this morning. Um, it's always nice to have an opportunity to come out and speak about the work that we're doing at the Holocaust and Human Rights Center and throughout the state as well. The photo, before I say anything else, the photo on the cover of Emile's book, we also have that hanging in the Michael Clark Center. Um, one of the things that visitors can do when they come to the center is see a film called Where the House Still Standing, Maine Survivors and Liberators Remember the Holocaust. And it focuses on the story of 15 Holocaust survivors and one liberator who moved to Maine at some point following the war. And one of those individuals featured is Emil. Uh, and so that's something that if you were to come and visit us, I would strongly encourage you to, to stay and see. So as Karen said, the center is located on the campus of the University of Maine at Augusta. We're open Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., as well as some evenings, some weekends, and by special appointment, meaning if you can't come during that time but still want to visit us, just call me and we'll open the doors. Uh, there's no fee to visit the center, and many of the programs that we offer are free as well. Our mission, if you boil it down, is basically that we're encouraging people to be kind and respectful to one another. That's the gist of it. The Holocaust, genocide, human rights abuses are cautionary tales of how bad things get when disrespect and unkindness spiral out of control. 
And so we hold those up as cautionary tales when we're speaking with students, when we're putting up exhibits that are hopefully relevant, uh, and offering a variety of programming. The building itself is called the Michael Clark Center, and it was named that in honor and in memory of Michael Clark, who was a hidden child survivor. He was hidden from the time he was six until he was eight years old on a rabbit farm in France. Um, and then, as Karen mentioned, he ended up going to New York where he had family and he stayed there and met and married a woman from Fort Kent, like you do. <laughs> and he then ended up spending a considerable amount of time in Maine. And his widow, Phyllis Chalbert, um, is now living in Freeport. She's one of our board members and is a significant supporter in a multitude of ways of the center. When Michael passed away in 1998, she made um, a generous contribution so that the building would be in his honor and memory. I'll go, I'm gonna go ahead and play the film and then chat more about what we're doing. Bonjour, je m'appelle Michel. My name is Michael. C'est moi, le petit garçon sur le tricycle. I'm the little boy on the tricycle. This is a Jewish neighborhood in Paris in the 1930s, just before World War II and the Nazi Holocaust. The children you see, Jewish kids like me, most of them never grew up. J'avais de la chance. I'm one of the lucky ones. That's me in the canoe, 50 years later, on the Allagash River in Maine. How did I survive? What happened to my parents? To the kids on this wall? To Jews all over Europe? Écoutez, ceci est mon histoire. This is my story. I was born Michel Clare on May 16, 1937, in Paris, France, in a neighborhood just like this one. I can't remember much about my parents. I didn't know them long enough. I know they came to France in 1928 from a town called Jolkiev in Poland. Life was hard there, and Paris was a big modern city full of freedom and opportunity for Jewish immigrants, until the Nazis came. Rachela, that was my mother's name, Yiddish for Rachel. All I remember is that she was beautiful and proud and loved camembert cheese. And me, nothing was too good for me. My father was Marcus Herzklar. People called him Herz. And he was in the fur business, my mother too, making Persian lamb coats and hats. Until the war came and no Jew could own a business or rent a house or go to school or anything. Years later, I found these old photographs. Me with my mother at a beach. Playing in a park in Paris. I don't remember those places. I remember her hair. My mother's thick black hair. I was three years old in the summer of 1940, when the German army invaded France. Horses and tanks and soldiers marching down the streets. It was like just being Jewish was against the law. You had to wear a black armband with a yellow star of David. Juif, it said. Jew. It was hard to get food, no heat in the houses, 
People were scared. My parents must have heard the stories. Everybody did. Terrible stories about work camps and death camps and Nazis killing all the Jews. You would go to a shop or visit a friend, and the next day the shop was closed. The friend was gone. You never saw them again. Jews just disappeared in the night. Nobody knew where. One morning at dawn, we packed, just a few bags, and without telling a soul we were leaving or where we were going, we boarded a train to Lyon, about four hours from Paris. We left everything behind, furniture, silver, my toys, everything we owned. The Nazis took it all. The family must separate, my parents explained. It's safer that way. Father will look for work in a tiny town called Boiron. Mother will buy forged identity papers in Lyon. And I will hide in a farmhouse outside Grenoble, in the village of La Tronche. It was a rabbit farm. I lived in a dark little stall with the rabbits. I remember them hopping all around me. The rabbits made a lot of noise, but I had to be very quiet. Keep very still, my mother said. I couldn't laugh or cry or talk out loud. I couldn't make a sound, not even to sneeze. I had to hold my nose. It wasn't a game. It wasn't like hide-and-go-seek. German soldiers were breaking down doors looking for Jews. And if they caught me hiding there, you would not be hearing this story. I remember soldiers coming into the house, right into the room near my hiding place. I couldn't see them, but I remember their boots. Loud, black boots stomping on the floor. That sound, the sound of boots, scared me for the rest of my life. My mother came to see me at the rabbit farm. I remember her last visit. I was holding on to her and laughing, and when she had to leave, I ran after her so hard I fell down. That was the last time I ever saw her. My man. I was six. My mother's brother, Uncle Leo, will tell you what happened. Rachel, Michelle's mother, was in Grenoble to visit him, and she sat down at the restaurant with a friend, a Jewish man. The Germans came in and demanded everyone's identity papers. Rachel had forged papers and spoke perfect French, so at first she survived the interrogation, but the Gestapo ordered her friend to stand up and take down his trousers. If he was circumcised, he was Jewish. The man was caught, of course, but the Nazis arrested them both, and they took Michelle's mother away. The last time I saw her, my mother told me that my father Hertz was coming soon to visit me. When? When? Soon, she said. And of course he never did, because on his way to come to visit with me, he was uh, in a cafe um, with a friend of his, buying food, which he probably would have brought to me because it was difficult to purchase food supplies in, in other than restaurants. And at that time, everyone was taken out of the cafe by a group of Germans and shot right there and then on the spot. There's a photograph of him after he was shot. Photographs were taken by people who lived above on the second and third floor, and they photographed various people being shot. This particular woman's husband himself was shot because he happened to have been in the restaurant. When she was going downstairs to, to retrieve her husband's body, my father was right. My father was killed right next to him, and she took his billfold with the bullet hole in it. And I have it. I have it today. And in, in that billfold were many pictures of me, and the bullet went through most of the photographs.
My father was in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he was Jewish. I lived with the rabbits as a hidden child from the winter of 1943 to the end of the war. In those three years, I had no friends, I never went to school, and both of my parents were murdered. I don't know how I survived or why, but I kept on surviving. I came by boat to America, 29 days on the ocean with hundreds of scared kids like me, all of us orphans now. Brooklyn, New York became my home. I made new friends and learned to speak English. Went to public school on a bus. Played stickball on the streets of Brooklyn. I got my first job at a custard stand on the boardwalk. Then worked in a supermarket to put myself through college. With time off to join the Marines. Like my father Harris, I always had energy. I couldn't sit still. And I loved people. I loved the art of the deal, so I went into real estate and helped lots of people find their first homes. That's how I met Phyllis Chalbert, the love of my life. Here we are getting married. Phyllis brought me here to Maine. Remember the man in the canoe? More than a million Jewish children died in the Holocaust. When I ask myself why I survived, I look at my children. I lived for them. Here I am, 50 years after losing my parents, after losing my childhood. Here I am holding my grandson and telling my story to you. That's what it means to survive. times you see it. Um, one of the things that I love is the fact that it, it highlights both the horrors as well as some of the light and hope. Um, and I feel that that's so important to keep both of those in mind when talking about something like the Holocaust. I think about those sort of ups and downs with what's happening today in our country, in our world. Um, we're living in pretty challenging, some would say unprecedented times, where the lack of civil discourse, the lack of respect is just tremendous. But then at the same time, the increase in civic engagement is phenomenal. So, at any rate, it's a, it, I find it helpful to keep both of those pieces in mind. So one of our hopes um, after we go to schools or we have people come visit us at the center is that they'll walk away with this idea that Kaylee walked away with. Um, and we didn't give Kaylee any money. Kaylee just sent this to us in a note. She said, I learned that one person can make a difference after visiting us with her, her sixth grade class. Um, since there isn't really one way to successfully achieve our mission, we try and do it through a number of methods, including rotating exhibitions, compelling programming, programming, special events, teacher training, and free educational outreach. So I'll just talk a little bit about each of those. Each year we create and present between three and five exhibits that are relevant and rooted in history as well and connected to our mission. These are some posters from past exhibits 
The exhibit that we currently have up is called Rescuers During the Ho uh, Heroism in Unjust Times, Rescuers During the Holocaust. Um, and it focuses on both individuals who, despite the fatal consequences, potentially fatal consequences, risked their lives to help those who were being targeted by the Nazis, as well as the individuals who they helped save. And specifically, we have stories of individuals whose descendants settled in or near Maine. Um, so, for instance, I was at the Common Ground Fair, and we had a booth there that year, and a man comes up to the booth, this is just this past September, and he said, have you seen the new film, the new Ken Burns film about the Sharps War, about Martha and Waitzel Sharp, who were two individuals who went over to um, Czechoslovakia and helped get Jewish children and other children who were being, whose families were being targeted out of Nazi-occupied Europe. And they were from Massachusetts. And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. I saw that film. Martha and her husband were designated as Righteous Among the Nations. That's a title that's given by the State of Israel to civilians. That's their only, only award they give to civilians um, for doing this high honor of helping Jews who were targeted during the Holocaust without receiving any sort of financial recompense. And so Martha and Waitzel received that designation. And this man who came up to my booth said, my mother-in-law was a righteous among the nations. I, said, I think we need to talk, because <laughs> I was planning to do this exhibit. And so it turns out that his mother-in-law, um, Dutch housewife, who about a year before it became illegal, in Holland uh, married her Jewish husband, Philip. So then when it became illegal for Jews and non-Jews to be married, she joined the Dutch resistance. They built a hiding space in her house, and she hid her husband and helped some 45 other Jews survive the war. Her granddaughter then settled on the New Hampshire Maine border. And her granddaughter is a nurse. And so she took care of her grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, and her grandmother, who was a righteous among the nations, in their final years, and learned all these incredible stories about their experiences. So right now at the center, we have an entire display case that has artifacts from Philip and Alejandra, who was her grandmother, on display. And there are artifacts that we, the granddaughter Julie and I sat down and, and we talked about what kind of message we wanted to get across with this display case. And what we settled on was the fact that it was ordinary people put into extraordinary circumstances who rose to the occasion. And so we've got things like the strainer that Julie now uses to strain pasta that her grandmother used in the kitchen while hiding her husband and taking care of their two toddlers during that time period. We've got the children's books that she would read to her kids while trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy when everything had gone crazy. And so it's that reminder that whether you're in that kind of a position or you're a diplomat, we all have this ability within us to rise to the occasion if it's necessary. So I felt like that was, that was kind of the angle that we took with this exhibit. It feels more appropriate than I would like for it to feel in our current times um, to have that inspiration. Uh, but that's, so that's the exhibit that we currently have up. And that's on display through August 11th, if you want to swing in and see that. We offer a variety of programming throughout the year. Um, most recently, we showed a film called the Susan, uh, Disobedience, the Susan Mendes story, which also focuses on an individual who was named Righteous Among the Nation. We did that as part of our Holocaust Day of Remembrance event. Um, and Susan Mendes was a Portuguese diplomat 
who, after his government had said you could no longer issue visas to undesirables, he issued some 30,000 visas to, <laughs> to Jews and non-Jews who were being targeted, including such notable people as Dolly, um, the authors of Curious George, uh, and then, you know, people's grandparents as well, you know, just the whole, whole range, so really, really tremendous. And we also have um, a display case about Susan Mendez because the, there's um, a woman whose mother received a visa from Susan Mendez to get out and she lives in Brooksville, Maine. Um, and so again, it was like this crazy um, timing that occurred where I just started to think about putting this exhibit together and I met this man whose mother-in-law is righteous among the nation and then Mona emailed me out of the blue and said, did you ever hear of this guy named Susan Mendez? Because my mom was saved by him. I no, I didn't. And now we have all this um, on, this, on display. Uh, we hold a variety of special events each year. One of the ones that I get most excited about is our annual meeting. And we just had ours, what's today, the 25th? Two weeks ago. It's not the 25th, the 22nd. <laughs> Two weeks ago from the 25th. Close enough. Uh, June 11th, we had it in uh, Falmouth, Maine. And each year we hold this event to honor and celebrate students and community members who are doing outstanding work in the field of Holocaust and human rights education and awareness. So we had, we honored Pius Ali, Portland Councilman, as well as Julia Poles, who's an eighth grader at Brunswick Junior High School. So a whole range of individuals who are, who are inspiring and remind us that we, our voices are very important at every stage of the game. We're a nonprofit. We have to have fundraisers, and I have to put this in here, so you know that. <laughs> um, we hold a variety of fundraisers. Uh, most recently, we had our Hearts for Human Rights fundraiser, which was held in Brunswick. Um, and this is more of a party than anything else. And my favorite part of this event was that we included the Pacintu Multicultural Chorus. If you have the opportunity to check them out, I would encourage you to do so. They are a group of young refugee and immigrant women from 25 different countries throughout the world, aged between 10 and 18, who have come to call Maine home. And these kids from all over the world sing together. And it is, ooh, I'm getting a little emotional. It's one of the most beautiful things um, in a time where we're really struggling with our differences to watch a group of kids who couldn't be more different coming together to sing in harmony. It's lovely. And so as part of this event, they, they came and they sang a few songs. We are very close to kicking off our first summer seminar. Uh, each year we hold two-day topic-specific seminars for K-12 through educators, librarians, lifelong learners, and this year for the first time for students as well. These are them. <laughs> July 11th and 12th will be, oh, nope, that first one, oh, I have to update this. Um, ignore some of that information on the bottom and <laughs> focus on me. <laughs> So July 11th and 12th, we will be holding our first seminar, but it's going to be called Yearning to Breathe Free, the Immigrant Experience in Maine. On July 19th and 20th, we're doing a seminar called The Holocaust and Human Behavior. On August 2nd and 3rd, we're doing a two-day seminar on civil discourse for adults. And then on August 8th and 9th, civil discourse for students. And all of this information is in the folders that I brought uh, that are on the table there. So if you want to pick one up, you can find out more information uh, about the seminars and everything else I'm talking about. And the cards in there as well if you have any questions later on. 
One of our biggest pushes is free educational outreach. Um, and it will be free for as long as that is possible because I feel like it is so important to be having these conversations that finances shouldn't be a barrier. So we go throughout the state from Fort Fairfield, my co-director is going to Edenden, Maine, which exists, I've never heard of it, Carabasset Valley, maybe, to Gorham, to South Berwick, all over the place. Um, and we visit middle schools, high schools, we provide community presentations as well. And we also have bus money to bring students to us. Our goal is to reach 5,000 students each year. Um, right now there are two of us who do the outreach, so it's a fairly ambitious goal. Um, this school year, well, just to give you an idea of the, um, what's the word, chronology, we shifted the type of programming that we were offering about four years ago. When we, before we shifted it, we were reaching about 400 students throughout the state. When we shifted it, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we shifted it, it we increased to reaching about 1,600 students. The following year, we reached 2,600. To the school year prior, we reached a little under 4,000, and this year we'll reach about 4,300. So clearly, the need and desire to talk about challenging topics, despite the fact that they're challenging, isn't diminishing. Currently, we offer six programs. They're customizable. They run about an hour in length. Some are broad, and some are more topic-specific. So for instance, decision making in times of injustice talks broadly about the steps leading up to the Holocaust. And then Kristallnacht focuses on a specific time period, November 9th and 10th of 1938, when the Nazis carried out a two-day <coughs> program of violence and terror against Jews. It was known as the Night of Broken Glass. Um, and so teachers have the opportunity to pick from something that's going to be a broader brushstroke and something that'll really focus more on a specific topic. Almost all of our programs end with this very helpful teaching tool. This is called the Pyramid of Hate. Have you seen this before? Have you seen this before? No? Okay, great. Um, we didn't come up with this. The Anti-Defamation League came up with this. And specifically, they employed the help of social scientists and historians who have studied genocide. And they didn't just study the Holocaust, which is an instance of genocide, they started, studied the Armenian genocide and the Rwandan genocide. Unfortunately, the many genocides that have occurred since. And what they realized was that there's actually a pattern that's present in all of those genocides. First, people develop prejudice attitudes. That's step one. They accept stereotypes. They scapegoat. Once that's in place, acts of prejudice aren't so difficult. Things that seem innocent, like name-calling or socially avoiding and excluding people, those begin to occur. And once that's in place, discrimination is just a step away, followed by genocide, followed by violence, rather, and then genocide. And so what we focus on primarily are these first two steps. Because that's what, if we're being honest, we're complicit in. That's what we see more commonly in our communities. And with students in particular, that's something that they're very aware of. I ordinarily ask kids to raise their hand if they've done something, seen something, or been the victim of something on the first two steps. And for the most part, they'll honestly raise their hands. Now, because we have our hands in the air, that doesn't mean that we're then going to go out and commit violence. It simply means that those first two steps are in our control. And so the idea, simplistic as it is, is that if we work together to eliminate the first two steps, you can't get to the other three. And so we put this in the context of something like the civil rights movement that spiraled out of control because these first two steps were so solidly in place. And that's why things like being respectful and inclusive and kind to one another, seemingly small acts, are actually extremely important. And 
and that's the big message that we that we're trying to send to students and remind ourselves as well. I've used this in conversation. I moved here from Long Island, New York, where I grew up in a conservative Jewish household with a big Jewish population. And here, for the first time, I would have people tell me that I was the first Jew they had met. I was like, that's interesting, how do I look? You know, <laughs> we'll think of it. And it was also the first time that someone made a Jew joke in front of me to sort of see how it would land. And at first I had no idea how to respond because it was so foreign to me, that kind of a, a comment. But we had this tool and I kid you not. I said, so there's this thing I use when I'm talking to students. And on it, it notes that name calling is the second step on a pyramid of hate. And so that's offensive to me when you do that. And this is what you're participating in. And he, you know, he recoiled immediately, confronting, he's not even a bully, he's my friend. That was the thing, coming from a friend. But being able to use this to have that conversation was really helpful, because those are tricky conversations. Um, that line, well, it was just a joke. It can be, but where, where do you draw the line, you know? And that's, you can't argue with someone's feelings. Someone says to you, that hurts me, that offends me, that's how they genuinely feel, and so I think you need to respect that. This is also in those folders as well. Oh, this, give, this is just sort of gives the visual of where we've increased our outreach, but I can kind of skip past that. So everything that we do, we do in partnership. Oh, Skadonfa might be on there. If not, I should add you. So these are just some of the partners that we've had um, in the last three or four years, doing exhibits, programming, educational outreach. Um, we can't do anything alone. We found that it's not effective to go it alone, so we try and partner whenever possible. So if you know of other organizations or schools or individuals who might be interested in learning more about we're doing, what we're doing or maybe have something that would be appropriate for us to host at the center, please please let me know. Yeah, that's my spiel. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take questions. Yeah? Did uh, Michael uh, Clark ever know anything about the people who sheltered him? Um, it was on a farm, so it was farmers, mm -hmm. and they, they don't know too much because he was just a kid, you know, and his parents were killed, so he couldn't ask them, um, and so not too much, other than the fact that they were farmers who were willing to help. Yeah, yeah. In the film, the last scene when he was holding a grandchild up, where, where was that? Oh, that's, um, I believe that's at Columbus Circle in New York. It said Maine over the top. Yeah. Um, I think that that was what Phyllis had said. I think. I'll, I'll double check. That was what I last heard, that it was somewhere in Columbus Circle. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you go into the schools, how do you present? I mean, do you have like a student body, or do you, how young do you start? What does that look like? Sure. So, we tend to not go younger than sixth grade. That said, we've spoken to kindergartners, not often, um, and not about that. When we speak to little guys, it's much broader and just about being kind and accepting. For the most part, it's sixth grade and above. We try to limit the group size to around 40 because we've found that students are more willing to participate if it's in a smaller group, and our programs aren't stand and deliver. All of it is conversation. That said, we've spoken to groups as big as 1,000. And that time when we went there, we were told there were going to be 100 people. And they forgot to add the zero on the end. We <laughs> showed them a huge auditorium. We winked it. It was fine. Um, but mostly we try to stick to smaller groups. We tr also try and limit um, the number of programs we present to two. Sometimes we'll do three programs in one day, um, but 
we've just found that because the, maybe because the topic is, is heavy and emotional, by the third one, we're just not as good as presenters. Um, and so we try and stick to two. Yeah. It varies. Um, some schools have us augmenting a unit that they're already working on. Others have us kicking off a unit. And, it, and really, we have a, a wide enough variety that we can kind of fit into either of those um, places. But sometimes students don't know anything about it. That, though, I found is more rare. I found more often that even if students haven't learned it in school yet, like sixth graders, they're not generally learning um, about the Holocaust yet. They might have learned about the Civil Rights Movement, the immigrant experience in Maine. That program is very, very topical, very current, and so that seems to be more of a common conversation topic. But by the time we get to eighth graders or high schoolers, most have touched on most of these topics that we talk about. Yeah, um, the diversity in Maine, I think, is different than what we think of when we initially think of the word diversity, because diversity can also apply to economics, it can apply to housing, it, it can, right, yes, yeah, so there's a whole range, um, and I think that it's, a, that it's okay to start that conversation there, because we come up with this sort of wider, broader term for that idea of diversity, and then you don't really feel as excluded from it. We can all be included in some level, yeah. But the diversity is increased. The more traditional diversity is increasing. So, which is, I think, very good. Yeah. It, do you collaborate with Facing History and ourselves? Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, what was the question? Do we collaborate with Facing History and ourselves? Facing History in Ourselves is a phenomenal organization based out of Brookline, Massachusetts. And it's now an international program. And basically, they create curriculum for, high, they focus more on high school students, it seems, but you can do it with middle school students and college students as well. It's curriculum that's um, geared towards encouraging students to be critical thinkers, socially aware, civically engaged, kind and respectful. And they have a whole variety of case studies that they use um, to attack their mission. And they bring students and teachers on this journey, the Facing History in Ourselves journey that starts from the individual, goes through a case study, and then ends with choosing to participate. So it's about taking the history and then figuring out how to apply it to today and then do something with it. And since they're so wonderful, I wanted to try and figure out how we could work with them. And so the Holocaust and Human Behavior program that we offer is a Facing History in Ourselves program that when teachers take it here in Maine, they then have access to all of Facing History in Ourselves books um, and the website, which has a whole bunch of resources. They, Facing History in Ourselves doesn't, hasn't been offering courses this far north, um, and so I wanted that to be available. And so, yes. We do work with them. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for having me.